Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Per Atkinson, and I'm going to start out with telling you a little story that happened about 500 years ago. Um, first, uh, these are, uh, as a part of this uh, presentation and talk, I'm showing some of the photos and, and the places that I visit and uh, where I hang out. And this is Santa Cruz, California, um, originally from Sweden, but I've spent most of my adult life in uh, voluntary exile. Uh, and most of that time has been spent in, in California. So the story is this. Uh, you all know uh, Michelangelo's uh, David. And he was commissioned to create this piece of art uh, about 500 years ago in Florence. And uh, when uh, it showed, the Pope at the time, Julius II, uh, asked him where his genius came from. And he simply said, it's simple. I removed everything that is not David. And that had such an impression on me, so I decided to remove everything that is not there from my life. <coughs> Here's a little bit about me to start with. Uh, this is also Santa Cruz. Here's uh, how you phonetically pronounce my name, for if there's no Scandinavians around here. Uh, in Swedish, it's uh, Per Håkansson, uh, which is tongue twister. So uh, since I live in California, I made it simple, so it's Per Hawkinson. So I write the um, newsletter, Fewer Better Things, and it's kind of uh, self-explanatory. Uh, I believe that uh, we become happier uh, if we have fewer better things, not just in physical things, but also in uh, relationships, fewer better relationships, fewer better thoughts, and that we do fewer better things. Um, let's see here. There we go. And I live nomadically. Um, I spent five years uh, before the pandemic uh, traveling around the world and explore the, the whole space of being digital nomad just because I could, because I didn't have a lot of stuff. Uh, so I began with getting rid of things, and then I realized I've, I have so few things so I can actually move seamlessly in the world, and I want to explore that. And everything I do is by experiments. I, I get this idea, and then I do something and test it out to see if it, if it works not just sort of academically, but also sort of functionally. But these days, I'm mostly in California. Uh, I love surfing. There are three things I really love in life and that I do, and they transcend to other things. But the core of it is the ocean, so surfing and sailing and swimming, and I played water polo in school. Photography, really in love with the, taking photos and all the art forms that, that comes from that. And I love books, so writing and, and, and reading and all kinds of arts. Um, I'm an ex-techie, so I spent uh, my first uh, 10, 15 years uh, out of college in Silicon Valley in the tech world. So I know that world really well. Uh, it's good to know with uh, my background because uh, this experiment with fewer better things started out as just a curiosity about the technology and the promise that it brought in the mid-90s when I left university to, to work in a what was then very unusual startup world. It didn't really exist. We didn't say startups. It was just uh, internet companies. Everyone thought we were just you know, living in, in bunkers and basements and did a lot of coding. Uh, <clears throat> boy, were they going to be surprised. Um, and after that, once I, I left that world, um, I trained executives across the world in digital transformation. So that's when I also became a digital nomad because I traveled so much, so there was no reason that I, to actually have an apartment anywhere because I was on the move all the time uh, for almost five years. Um, and I have two fantastic uh, uh, and amazing groms. And groms is basically you know, kids that you know, surf or skateboard or do any kind of uh, uh, extreme sports. Um, but the, all of this began of my curiosity to explore technology. Because in the mid-90s, in the internet was very new. Uh, there was only about 10 million people online. I was one of them, and I didn't want to go into consulting or banking or any other, other opportunities that was given to me after studying economics. Uh, so I want to explore this world that actually promised us that we could work from anywhere, and technology was going to make us more free, and we're going to have to work less. And I thought, compared to banking, that's a great proposition. <laughs> so let's, why don't I you know, uh, join a startup? And it turned out that I, I spent 10 years in the startup world, I worked my ass off, 18 hours a day. Uh, I lost my time, I lost my um, attention, and I lost my creative energy. 
so we're now looking at 2005, and I need a break. I've be already been in this really new industry for 10 years, and I'm completely burned out. And I start thinking about, so I took a year off, and I started thinking about and you know, reflecting after, probably took three months before I, I got out of the, the, the workaholism and, and felt that I could actually breathe and think again. I started to think about how can I regain this time and attention and, and creative energy? Because I started this journey to actually get more of this, because that's what technology has been promising all through history, that thanks to technology, you can actually work less and you can do, create more value, you can focus more on the things that really matter to you, and you can be more creative. And that as the time went by, I realized that technology was actually doing the same thing as, as a lot of other industries. The time that we actually free up with technology was not going to me as an individual. So I decided, okay, let's explore this. How can I actually liberate the uh, time and attention and creative energy that's been hijacked um, from me? And that's when I started to explore the fewer better things. And it began as a journey, in, uh, and here's five simple sort of insights that I've had. But the first one is uh, regarding your stuff. Um, and that's how I got into this. I want to get rid of a lot of things. So I started to reduce, just like uh, Michelangelo when he created David, I wanted to have the same kind of idea in my life. I wanted to reduce my life down to just being myself, being pair. And through that journey, I actually needed to figure out who the hell I, I am or who the hell I was, and why am I here, and what do I really need? And I discovered that all uh, through advertising and in society, and also through my education, it had all been about what do you want to do, not what do you need to do. So I started shifting away from the wants and the dreams and started looking inwards and ask myself, what do I really need in this life? So Maslow has this hierarchy of, uh, of, hierarchy of needs, and I thought that we've gotten to a place where we can actually focus on self-realization, and that's where I wanted to be. What does that mean? Does that mean buying more shit that I never use, or does that mean something else? Because what I saw was that in, in during university, we had the same ambition to go out and do big things, but we yet we ended up with more things than our parents. So in 2005, I had a sports car, a big pad in San Francisco. I had all different kind of stuff, and I was absolutely miserable. And I realized that I needed to get back to uh, the original dream, which was returning to California, because I went to school, high school in California, returning and go surfing. That's what I wanted to do. The whole idea about moving to California was actually to not be in office, but being outdoors, you know, going to Mammoth and mountain bike and go to Yosemite and climb and go and surf in the ocean. And instead, I ended up in a, in a wonderful company at the time at Yahoo, uh, which was very exciting to be at, but I was working my butt off all the time, and I didn't really have any and the influence or control of the time and attention and creative energy that I started out seeking. So it began with the reducing everything. I started to think about how can I reuse stuff in a smarter way? How can I repair things? And, and I also was looking at reselling, which came later on, and which now a lot of companies are already doing. You know, Finisterre, Patagonia, Outer Known. There's, there are no new uh, resale platforms. Trove is one of them that powers Patagonia that where you can actually, you buy the products and then you can sell them back to the company that created them and they sell them further on. So through this, I created <clears throat> certain constraints uh, for how I interact with um, producers of goods. Uh, and uh, as you know, there's something that's called consumer relationship management. But there's a couple of scientists at Harvard that looked at vendor relationship management. So, it, so it's my, how I relate to and manage the vendors in my life. So I thought that's a great idea. So let's create a couple of criteria of how I want to interact with the companies that are producing things that I actually need. And I said, well, they need to be sustainable. They need to be able to use recycled materials. They need to be able to uh, have a resale platform so I can pass it back on. In, in some shape or form. Because during the reduction, when I took my whole closet and reduced it down to what can fit into a backpack, I, I learned that you don't get a lot of cents on the dollar for the stuff you bought. And it was also a pain in the ass to get rid of things. So I thought, why don't I just 
deal with companies that all are built that into their business model. So I, and it also needs to be, what I need are things that can actually be used in nature. So most of the things that we buy that works in the city doesn't work in nature. You freeze your ass off if you wear a coat in nature. But everything you design for nature works in the city. So why don't focus on things that works everywhere and transcends both nature and, and city and, and travel and everything I want to do and that I use frequently, which means it's either on a daily or weekly basis. I don't need the instant gratification because I already realize that that doesn't make me happy. Another Paul Smith shirt, if I already have 10 of them, the happiness is marginal, maybe lasting half a day, a couple of hours, and it's a waste of time because I never use it, and then I have to dispose of it if I don't want to buy a bigger house and have more stuff. So that was the first um, insight. So I focused on all the things. And then I realized that as the, as the internet grew, um, there was actually more. I mean, it took more of our time. And I realized that we become hyper convenient. And this is now we're sort of in the, in, in the 10. So now we're the, the last 10 years when everything become, became very convenient. And I explore this world by um, seeing how can I move around in the world and survive and thrive by only using three things. So I headed out traveling with only my passport, the credit card, and my phone. And the first destination was River Cottage in Dorset, because I like food and I like cooking, and I like that kind of organic approach to cooking. So I went there and uh, for a day hung out with the Hugh Ferning Wittenstall, uh, but I didn't bring anything. Uh, I thought that let these 11 days that I'm here just be an experiment in understanding what do I really need. So I get to the, to the B&B, uh, which is about 45 minutes from his river cottage, and I walk in, and I have nothing. I just show my, my ID, and you know, I pay for the Airbnb, and I have my phone. I don't even have a charger. Um, and I ask him, and at that point, I'm starting to probably need you know, new clothes. So I ask the guy, uh, I tell him, hey, hey I'm going to go to river cottage. I'm going to be a better cook. Can you help me out? And so he got so impressed that he said, oh, of course, I'll, I'll do that. What do you need? I need, if you could, every second day in the evening, can I come around and drop off all my clothes? You wash them. Don't need to do anything. Wash them and dry them. And then I'll pick, you know, just hang them on my door, and I should be fine. Uh, and so he said, I'll do that. So the first day, and it was empty in the lobby when I asked him this. So I walk, wake up, or I walk up to the, my room. I undress. I put on a towel. I walk down, and the lobby is packed with people. <laughs> I just woke up to the guy and said, thank you very much. Please have this you know, fixed by tomorrow morning. I just went back to my room and closed the door. And I realized that just asking for help, you need even less things. And that gave me the confidence of, OK, fine. During that trip, I learned I need a couple more things. It's good to have a charger, maybe an extra t-shirt. Toothbrush is advisable. Um, so next time, I packed a backpack with a couple of things. But it was never more than 30 liters. And that's how I lived for five years all around the world and survived in all different kinds of climates as long as it wasn't really extreme cold. Then I needed to pack on a couple of new things. But since we live in a, in a hyper-connected world where you can access anything you want with your mobile phone, you can, also, you can rent anything anywhere. So you don't really need to own all these different things except for what you frequently use. And that's something that I... I realized, so I, I either I asked if I could borrow uh, or if I could rent, or in some certain instances, I, if it was something that I thought that I was going to use frequently in the future, I could also uh, buy it. And this, this, that I realized that, well, in the end of the day, there's, there's only three things that are scarce in the world today. I mean, there used to be scarcity with access, and used to be scarcity when it came to food and, and certain brands, but all companies today are everywhere. You can access anything you want through your mobile phone or any kind of uh, device. That's how everything has been digitized. You know, people have been digitized, places have been digitized, data and things. So there are three things, and that's the time. Time is something that's scarce. We all know that. We have a limited, and it's a finite time. Attention is finite. And we're giving away our attention mindlessly in many, many cases. 
Uh, and we do that because companies become so good at hacking our human behavior and the, 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 our social need and monetizing that, that they, they can actually grab that attention and suck that out of us. And then the third thing is the creative energy. So I decided, okay, I'm on, 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 a, on a journey here to, to reclaim that and get that back. So <clears throat> the rewilding part is being okay with, uh, oh, it's going back. So the rewilding part here is to be being okay with being uncomfortable, uh, not having access to, uh, to everything, not getting that pizza delivered in that street corner when you happen to be a little bit hungry. It's sort of letting go of that, not always having to, 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 to see the, the latest message or check the, the um, uh, email inbox. People on average check their inboxes, the email inboxes, 77 times a day. People on average check their phones 368 times a day. So when I see people walk around, and as soon as they, you catch their eye, they look at the phone. And they look up and they keep looking at the phone, or if they're bored. And I think all that time that we're getting sucked into this world is the time when we, we actually waste our, our time and attention and that creative energy that we can spend for something better. So rewilding means that, you know, be uncomfortable. Let's see if we can. There we go. Owning your own schedule means that in this world where, when everyone is demanding stuff from you, it's saying no and create your own boundaries and setting your own schedule. Turning off those devices when you need to do deep work. Turning on the devices when you need to work out and live in the moment. So my schedule, and I started doing this um, during, this, um, during the pandemic, was to get up at five in the morning, surf, no, no checking inboxes, anything like that, until after nine o'clock. So between five and nine in the morning, that's my time. It's surfing or walking on the beach, uh, meditate, have breakfast, just get, set the day straight. Because the world can wait. There's nothing as, you know, as, as if that's super important for me because I'm neither a doctor or you know, a president or anyone that needs to be be contacted really, really, really urgently. Uh, this is from Punta de Lobos, by the way, in Chile, which is um, uh, preserved thanks to Patagonia. And I went down, I've been down there surfing a couple of times, and it's an absolutely magical place, but it's the coldest place. It's colder than, than, than England uh, surfing. It's really super cold. It's the only place I've been surfing where, where actually my, my feet turn completely white after an hour. I don't like footsies. Uh, and so the fourth thing then, so when you've, once you've done this, you've reduced everything down to what, uh, who you are, and uh, you own your, your schedule, you're, you're comfortable with, with not being connected with everything all the time, then it's about uh, switching between discovery mode and maker mode. So it's opening up the world, so it's having a wide funnel, but a very narrow filter. And that connects back to who you are, why you're here, and what do you really need. And let your interest uh, and your passion and your curiosity check out different things. But to me, that means that I'm not interested in, in a, in a uh, play by play update on some news that goes on in the world. I'm interested in finding out a little bit deeper how does AI work? Okay, so it's a machine learning with a little bit, you slap on a little bit of statistics. And okay, fine, I get that. How does other things work? And then you go from there and you continue and unravel this. But, uh, switch back to focusing on, okay, this is the stuff that I need to do uh, to keep, keep doing and living the life that I want to live. So it's a really important when you uh, sort of create some distance to technology to still be open and have that wide funnel and follow the right people, having the right sources, but do that intentionally. Uh, the fifth one and the last, um, <clears throat> uh, and this is Encinitas where I, I moved right before the pandemic and uh, uh, had the insight that, okay, now when everyone, what I've been talking about for the past 20 years, now people are actually getting uh, remote work. People are actually getting the digital transformation. People are understanding how to use apps. Now I'm going to go surfing. And that's what I did for two and a half years, uh, hanging out at the beach and, and worked my own stuff. And uh, I, you know, I did the opposite. I didn't do any video conferencing stuff. I went down every evening to the guys here that's been surfing and made friends face to face, having conversations, hung out, no TV, no videos, no screens, and it was absolutely amazing. All right, thanks very much.